Hello and welcome to GameSack. Can you believe this is the fifth episode talking about unreleased games? When I started making this one, I thought, eh, it might be a third or so, but nope, it's the fifth. Anyway, let's talk about some more games that were being made, but I never got released. First up, we have Dinosaur Planet from Rare on the Nintendo 64. This is the game that eventually became Star Fox Adventures on the GameCube, and it surprised the gaming community when this was found and released in February of 2021. It was never thought that a playable ROM of this existed, especially in a nearly complete form such as this. In this one, you start out by controlling Crystal, who is a furry trying to rescue a princess from the evil bad guy called Scales. It starts out as a Panzer Dragoon ripoff, kinda. This is over quickly though, and most of the game you'll be on foot. Like most games by Rare, there are tons of things to collect here, but it's nowhere near the level of something like Banjo-Kazooie. Mainly, you grab lots of different colored gems and dinosaur eggs. Eventually, you'll switch to playing as Saber, and he gets a sidekick who can help him out by digging things up and whatnot. Saber can grab lots of different items to help progress further. Shigeru Miyamoto wanted Dinosaur Planet to become a Star Fox game because he felt that the characters were similar. And this build is from after that change, where Saber is now Fox McCloud. Who's that? I am Fox McCloud, Royal Knight of the Lilat system. So by this point, it was already transitioning to what would eventually become Star Fox Adventures. Anyway, you also have magic that you can learn, and you'll need to use it in certain areas to solve minor puzzles. Overall, the control is pretty good. There's no jump button, but usually you don't need to jump. And when you do, it happens automatically. However, I did have some small issues with the swimming controls as sometimes Fox would climb up out of the water and other times he wouldn't. Instead, he'd start losing life. Aiming your reticle can seem a bit twitchy sometimes, but overall it's certainly nothing that breaks the game. Speaking of that, the game did crash on me once towards the beginning and I got this screen. And there wasn't much I could do about it. Sadly, I hadn't saved yet, so I had to start over from the beginning. The good news is that it seems like you can save almost anywhere and anytime you want to. I had to modify the save database on my EverDrive 64 to get the game to run, however, but that was easy enough once I found the information on a forum. Overall, I think this game is pretty ambitious for a Nintendo 64 game. For one, it uses 64 megabytes, which is much bigger than most games on the console. Everything is voiced and the sound quality isn't bad at all. My name is Crystal, and I've come for the princess. You seem a long way from home. Crystal. There are still some adjustments to the overall sound balance that need to be done though. For instance, a lot of the sound effects and digitized jingles are much too loud. The graphics are generally pretty high in quality, with the exception of the frame rate. You're not encased in fog or dither, and it's not too horribly blurry, at least on a CRT. But yeah, the frame rate sure suffers quite a bit sometimes. Everything obviously received a huge upgrade by moving to the GameCube, and as a result it's more playable, especially since it ran at a pretty much constant 60 frames per second. Of course, many changes to the story, gameplay, and level design would also occur on its journey to the GameCube. But you know what? I find this game more interesting as Dinosaur Planet. I have no issues with Fox McCloud being in it, but I don't think the name Star Fox should be anywhere in the title. In fact, if they had kept the name Dinosaur Planet, I think it would have been generally better received. When you call a game Star Fox, people want an entire game like this, and rightfully so. As it stands in this build on the Nintendo 64, Fox is more of a special guest star in this game, and that's kinda cool. Overall, I'm super happy that this was leaked for people to enjoy. It's especially fun seeing how similar yet different everything is from the GameCube game. Rare was at the top of their game during the Nintendo 64's lifespan, and this title is just another shining example of their glory days. Definitely be sure to try this one out if you're able to. Ah, that, that hit the spot. Tell you what, young'un, I'll help you out. Here you are, my boy. This is a map of the Snowhorn Wastes. You can collect maps from other tribes. I'm sure they'll be useful on your adventure. Remember Superman for the Nintendo 64? It was a bad game that's infamous for being bad. In fact, I'd say it's not good at all. But did you know that there was a cancelled Superman game for the PlayStation, also from Titus? Did you just say tits? 
This one was actually being developed by Blue Sky Software. This is a completely different game altogether, thankfully, but it still sucks. I start the game, and my first mission is to save helpless Jimmy from the mine. First of all, the control and especially the collision are absolutely horrible. Soon, I find that I need to rescue everyone in this room within 60 seconds. Why do I only have 60 seconds? Why did the designers think that adding a time limit would make the game more fun? Answer, it doesn't. It makes it less fun, and it's not much fun at all to begin with. The good news is that I seem to have unlimited lives so I can figure things out. Kind of. I rescued these cocoon dudes, but that's not good enough. They don't count as rescued until you talk to them. I rescue and talk to all the people that I can find, and the last one says that there are still more down the way, but there's quite literally no way I can make it to them in time, and there's no way to add time to your mission. I got sick of the game at this point and turned it off. Uh, don't give me that look. You would too. A more complete version of the game was dumped on DeviantArt of all places in 2020. This one is much more playable, but once again, it still sucks. Gone is the time limit. I am still rescuing people, but this time I'm in a parking garage. Mainly, I have to freeze machines to unlock doors or even freeze the doors themselves and punch through them. Many of the hostages are injured, so you have to go and find first aid kits to heal them. You also need to find a bunch of keys to unlock garage doors because, of course, Superman is too wimpy to force them open with brute strength. I mean, it's not like he's a Superman or anything. I'll never understand Superman as a character. He's pretty much invincible, so why is he always so limited in video games? Anyway, of course, he can only carry one item at a time. Damn, it must suck for him when he's unloading the car after grocery shopping. Anyway, this means he'll need to go back and forth again and again to accomplish simple tasks. There are these kryptonite orbs floating around, at least that's what I assume they are. If Superman touches them, he's pretty much powerless for about 10 seconds. But the main challenge comes from the awful camera and the sheer repetition. At one point, after rescuing Lois, I died for... I have no idea why I died. I turned the game off here as I'd had enough of this in my lifetime. The graphics are much sharper than the Nintendo 64 game as PlayStation graphics tend to be, and not horrible overall. The music is repetitious, and not in a good way. I'm glad that Warner Brothers pulled the license from Titus for the Superman IP and spared the world of this game. It's just too bad that they didn't pull it before the Nintendo 64 version was released as well. There are a lot of games that honestly, I'm pretty happy never got released. Like all of these in the next nine plus minutes that I'll be talking about. Except maybe the second one, which is honestly is kind of fun and cheesy in its own way, but I don't think anyone's tremendously disappointed that it didn't make it out for this particular system. Anyway, let's go. Bedlam was a game from Mirage Technologies and GT Interactive that was released for the PlayStation, Mac, and PC. It was also in development for the Saturn here, but this version was cancelled. This game is basically a crappy twin-stick shooter with some very light strategy elements. The first stage is a brief tutorial showing you what the various colored buttons do like raising and lowering platforms or shooting things down in order to open fences and whatnot. After this, you're set out on your own. On the Saturn here, it controls almost exactly like Xenocrisis on the Genesis except crappy. That means you move in all eight directions with a directional pad. The X button shoots left, the Y button shoots up, the B button shoots right, and the A button shoots down. You can also shoot diagonally by pressing two buttons together. Before each mission, you can buy weapons to equip your vehicle, which the game calls a rat. You're free to roam around the levels, which are incredibly large. You're basically searching for the exit while collecting a few things here and there. Dear God, is this game super choppy. A game like this desperately needs to move at 60 frames per second at all times, but it often only moves at a tenth of that frame rate. As a result, it's tough to tell what's going on and you feel detached from the game. It's definitely a game that makes the Saturn look weak, but this isn't that kind of episode. I took a quick look at the PC and PlayStation versions on YouTube, and they weren't exactly buttery smooth either. I don't think that frame rate was a priority with these developers. The thing is, though, is that this game could easily run at 60 frames per second on the Saturn. It's completely 2D and not even very complex. 
The craziest thing they tried to do with the graphics are these screens in the stage which mirror what you're doing, but even they're pretty laggy. The sound isn't much better either as the effects are mostly awful. Oftentimes it sounds like someone is constantly kicking a dog somewhere in the stage. Even if these technical issues were addressed, I don't think this game would be a winner. No official reason was ever given for its cancellation, but I'm thinking it was because the developers just couldn't handle the Saturn, and also that the game was just not very good to begin with. The arcade FMV light gun game called Crime Patrol from American Laser Games was ported to a lot of home consoles, including the CDI, 3DO, PC, and Sega CD. That's right, only the best consoles got this game. But did you know that there was a planned version for the Sega Saturn? Well, now you do, and here it is. In this one, you need to make sure to shoot the evil criminals and don't shoot the innocent bystanders who frequently get in the way. This sounds easier than it is, as the evil criminals seem to have a tiny hitbox and a very small window of time when you can actually hit them. I first tried playing this with the Saturn Stunner light gun, which is usually pretty awesome. Unfortunately, it only worked intermittently in this game. After I reloaded the gun a few times during a stage, the game would stop recognizing my trigger pulls and it wouldn't flash the screen for a good 20 seconds or so. So yeah, this game still needs a bunch of work. Then I tried with the regular controller and I was able to do much better, but it's still pretty tough. The good news is that you can continue and keep trying as many times as you want after you make it to one of the many checkpoints in each stage. You can even change stages and begin from a previous checkpoint that you reached there if you get bored with the stage that you're currently playing. Some parts of the game seem nearly impossible with a regular controller though. How am I supposed to hit these tiny targets? I don't even have time to move my reticle over them and it's not very precise as you can imagine. I bet I could nail them if the light gun was fully supported. The FMV is all pretty cheesy, and I love it. Oh, this thing will fry you. While it's certainly not the future of video gaming that companies thought it would be in the 90s, there is still something I kind of love about it, at least in short bursts. I like how when you accidentally kill a security guard, your partner seems to be almost amused. That was the security guard you shot. <laughs> yeah, you big silly oaf. His wife and family will be devastated, but since you're such a big goofy bozo, I won't tell the chief. The FMV video quality here isn't outstanding. Hmm, FMV video, full motion video video, yeah, that's redundant. Oh well, I'm not changing it. Anyway, it's full of interlacing combing artifacts if you know what to look for. They didn't even bother de-interlacing. And yes, that technology existed in the 90s. I don't think that is any loss that this game was canceled towards the end of its development. Would have been nice though to see a version that used the MPEG card. We're at the silent alarm, we'll advise. Be advised, backup is five miles away. Let's kick butt! I'll take a left. Don't shoot! Freak Boy from Virgin is another unreleased game for the Nintendo 64. This was going to be an early game for the console and you can definitely tell in regards to its design. You play as a blue thing that's half freak, half boy. You glide around levels solving puzzles in order to advance. In order to deal with these puzzles and the enemies, you can equip yourself with colored diamond thingies that are dispersed from these machines that are laying around. Your freaky boy body can hold up to three different parts at a time. I was only able to experience the red and the purple parts. The red parts can be worn and then tossed off with the R button. At this point, they'll start ticking down for a couple of seconds and then explode, damaging enemies and destructible things nearby. The purple parts act like a drill or a saw. This allows you to cut through obstacles that kind of look like wood. The yellow C buttons are dedicated to your camera, and this is kind of how you can tell it was an early game as those buttons were originally supposed to be dedicated to such things. You can jump, but the platforming absolutely sucks here. What's really weird though is that the start button does a super jump not a button you typically associate with such an action. I was able to get on this thing, which reminded me a lot of a similar thing in Super Mario 64, only crappy. 
I was able to get a little further into the first level when the game froze. This is an alpha build, so it's not surprising that this happened. However, at this point, I was ready to rid my life of Freak Boy, so I didn't try again. The visuals are drab and honestly depressing as hell. Permanent fog obstructs views into the distance. There's really nothing good that anyone alive could ever say about these graphics, even back in its day. There's actually music here, but it's repetitive and boring. Just like GameSack. Har, har, har. It's not fully known why this one was canceled, but I'm glad it was. I imagine that they felt it probably wasn't going to be very good, so it was abandoned. Sometimes things just don't work out and you don't know until you try. They probably got so far and said, well, yeah, this just isn't going to be very good, so let's just give up on this mess. So long, freak boy. You never got a chance to shine and nobody will ever miss you. He just wants to be loved, but nobody wants to love him. This game is called Colliders, and this is as close to a title screen as it gets. I had to add the text that you see here. This is an unreleased future sports game from ASC Games that was headed to both the Saturn and the PlayStation. I'm playing the Saturn version here because the Saturn kicks ass. I mean, the Saturn in general, not this game. The goal here is to grab the futuristic ball or puck with your futuristic robot and then shoot it into the futuristic goal. All of this takes place in the future. Getting a goal is harder than you'd think, but I somehow managed to do it once. I may or may not have also managed to shoot it the wrong way and score for the other robot team. What you see here is basically all that there is. The sound effects are extremely repetitive and annoying, and there's no music at all. I'm sure this would be better with two players or maybe online if some sort of League of Rockets were formed, but as a single player game, it's incredibly boring as it stands now. Not much more is known about this one, but I think that society just wasn't ready for colliders in the late 90s. Only future civilizations can handle this. A future where everyone is a robot. Alright, let's finish this episode up with three games that I think could have been great had they been finished up and released. Well, except for that last one. I do not know what they were thinking with that. Anyway, first, let's check out Viewpoint 2064 and then something for the Game Boy. And then after that, seriously, what the hell? Here's Viewpoint 2064 for the Nintendo 64, published by Sammy. This is a sequel to the original game on the Neo Geo. This one was being developed by Rackdom. The original game featured an exciting isometric view which allowed your ship to move left, right, backwards, and forwards, but not up and down. The control in this game is the same, except that most of the time you're facing forward. You can't move up or down on the screen. However, you have a cursor that you can move around, and if you're holding the fire button, you can lock onto enemies Panzer Dragoon style. Release the button to fire up to eight heat-seeking missiles. You can collect a few different options which will add a little bit to your firepower. Not only that, but if you press the R button, they form a shield in front of you to block some of the enemy fire. As you do this, you'll build up an energy meter on the bottom of the screen. Once this is full, you can press the B button to fire off a super powerful shot. Unlike the original, there are no charge shots or bombs in this game. At the end of each stage is a boss encounter, just like you'd expect. These bosses can take a long time, but at least they have a life bar that moves very slowly. In the later stages, the life bars can double and even triple up on themselves like boss life bars in the beat em up. Good luck. Hell, a couple of the bosses don't even have a life bar at all. Oh well, you're probably not going to win anyway. This game can be pretty tough during these boss fights. After you win a boss fight, you can choose your next stage. There are a total of 15 stages, though you can only play through 5 on a single playthrough. At some point during most of the stages, the viewpoint will change, pun intended. During this time, your ability to lock onto things will be gone and you'll just need to shoot and or avoid obstacles until the viewpoint recenters itself. 
This adds some variety to each stage, and I didn't care for it at first, but ended up kind of appreciating these fun little breaks. This game certainly isn't finished. Sometimes you can fly right through objects without taking any damage. This may be because these are completely unavoidable and they can't be damaged by your weapons, so the developers just let you pass through them so that the rest of the stage could be tested. Many of the stages feature lengthy areas which there are literally no enemies and nothing to do except wait for a while. The options that you've collected are shown at the bottom right of the screen, but you can't cycle between them like you should be able to. Overall, it's still mostly playable. I found the graphics mostly average for the console. Not a lot of strong colors and the draw distance isn't great. The enemy designs are pretty cool though. And this is a loud game. I turned the sound effects and the options way down, but I don't think it changed anything, or at least not much. There are still many sound effects which are still incredibly loud. Some of the music is kind of average, but there are a few tracks here that are really quite good. In fact, they kind of sounded like the work of Hitoshi Sakimoto. There aren't any credits in the game, so it's impossible to be sure, but according to the internet, the music was done by Harumi Fujita, a former SNK and Capcom musician. Many of the stages do share themes, and there's not really a ton of music here. This game was set for release in 1999 and then again in 2000, but it kept missing its release date for unknown reasons. Eventually, it was quietly cancelled, and an official reason has never been given at the time of this video. It's really too bad that this never made it out, as it's much more interesting than the Star Soldier game on the Nintendo 64 which actually got released. Even in its incomplete form here, it's a much better game. Give this one a go if you can. This is Death Track on the Nintendo Game Boy from Argonaut Software. First of all, this game has no sound at all, so all you have to listen to in this segment is my lovely voice. Sorry. Anyway, this is a racing game, and first you need to decide your name and stuff. Apparently, this was planned to support up to four players simultaneously, which would have been really cool. Before each race, you can buy stuff to enhance your ride. This looks like it's gonna be a cool isometric racer, right? Oh hell no, this is the freaking Game Boy. Ain't got no time for those baby graphics when you can do full wireframe 3D instead. This is the kind of power that you expect from the Game Boy. Without background music, it's kind of weird with me doing all these funky voices, but oh well. Surprisingly, the game controls fairly well for the most part, at least for the driving. If you let go of a direction, your vehicle will recenter itself, which takes a couple of seconds to get used to. Buying boosts and missiles in the store didn't seem to help as there was no way to fire the missiles. I had read that you could press down to fire them, but that didn't seem to work for me as far as I could tell. As far as the boosts go, you're supposed to press A and B at the same time, and this works as the number of boosts you have in stock decreases. But I'll be damned if I'm actually doing any boosting. As a result, this build is kind of boring, but I think that if it were finished up, it could have been something special. I really like the wireframe graphics, and I like how even the background seems to rotate when the screen tilts during a turn. There's no official word on why this one was cancelled, but I'll be honest, I'm a bit sad that it was. Granted, I doubt most of you feel the same as I do, but I just really dig wireframe graphics. Finally, we have a slightly interesting game for the Sega 32X that was cancelled, and it's called Virtua Hamster by Sega of America. Longtime GameSack viewers may remember this one, which was featured in an ending skit as Richard Gere's Virtual Gerbil in the very first unreleased games episode in 2016. Yes, this is a real game, but no, it's not a gerbil, and no, these tunnels are not what Richard Gere's colonoscopy team sees. According to the game's exciting story, you're a hamster named Chip, and you're scouring the tunnels for scuttles on your quest for freedom. I'm guessing that these things here are scuttles, but I can't be certain. This is a very early build. Or maybe these other dribbles, sorry, hamsters are scuttles? Hard to say. The option screen and control settings are merely placeholders, as most of these buttons don't work as they're indicated. Basically, if you press up, you move faster through the tube, and if you press down, you'll move slower. If you press button C, Chip goes into the screen, all the way until he disappears. If you press B, he moves towards the screen, again, until he's out of sight. 
If you press the A button, the game resets. In the upper left corner, there's a map that fills in as you explore. There are quite a lot of tubes to discover, and where the exit is is anyone's idea, if there even is one. There's really not much more to this build, and you'll get bored traversing all the tubes in no time. I do like how they look, though. The color and shading are good for flat polygons of the time. It really makes me wish that Stunrunner had been released on the 32X. The frame rate is also not bad for the time. The music isn't bad either, but it needs to be a lot better if I'm going to spend who knows how long trying to find the exit. The game's development supposedly moved to the Saturn after the 32X failed hard before ultimately being cancelled. It's also rumored that Sega of Japan didn't like the word Virtua being used as they didn't want it to be associated with actual good games like Virtua Fighter and Virtua Racing. My biggest question with this game is why development on such a concept even began in the first place? Who thinks of stuff like this and actually spends money working on it? Oh well. Anyway, like I said, it just makes me want to play Stun Runner. There you go, that was nine more games that never saw an official release. Would you have purchased any had they been released? I think Dinosaur Planet and Viewpoint 2064 both held a lot of potential, just in case I didn't make that obvious during their respective segments. But there are still a lot of prototypes for unreleased games floating out there that I do hope get leaked in the future, so keep an eye out for the sixth episode in the series if that happens. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. just picked up zany golf on the genesis oh you thought i was gonna file it under z didn't you well that raises an excellent question where should i file this game should i file it under z for zany golf or w for will harvey presents how about this game should i file it under t for tough enough or under h for hey punk are you tough enough master the moves to master me or how about Death Duel? File it under D or file it under 8 for 8 Meg? That's right, 8 Meg is actually part of the title. Also, where do I file this one? Do I file it under G for Golf Magazine Presents? Under 3 for 36 Great Holes? Or under F for Fred Couples? Who can say? And of course, the classic example. For Resident Evil. Do I file it under R for Resident Evil or under 4? Same question for Resident Evil 6. Do I file it under R? 6? Or maybe I should file it under G because it looks like a guy in a draft costume is getting a blowy. Actually, you know what? I know where I'm going to file all these games and it's under T for trash because these are absolute garbage games. Well, actually, there is one in there that is kind of a classic and I think you know which one it is. 8 Meg Death Duel. Anything with 8 Megs in the title has to be awesome.